was a man of ideas, but he wasn't ideological. Colin Powell dedicated his extraordinary life to public service because he never stopped believing in America. He was the first black American to hold top national security positions in the U.S. government, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, national security advisor, and finally Secretary of State, a critical post he used to make the case for the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. Hello and welcome to Inside America with me, Rida Fakhri. The passing on Monday of General Colin Powell, an icon of U.S. military and political life, revered by Republicans and Democrats alike, and whose illustrious career at the service of both Republican and Democratic presidents is quite uncommon, has reignited the debate over Powell's responsibility in making the case for war in Iraq, both internationally and to the American people. The four-star general, son of Jamaican immigrants, who served directly under Presidents George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush, died from COVID complications at the age of 84. He was suffering from multiple myeloma, a type of blood cancer that can severely compromise the immune system. Despite being a member of the Republican Party, Powell endorsed Democratic candidates in the last four presidential elections, starting with Barack Obama in 2008. He was also a vocal critic of former President Donald Trump, calling him, quote, a national disgrace who should have been removed from office through impeachment. Following the January 6th storming of the U.S. Capitol, Powell said he no longer considered himself a Republican. Despite his trailblazing record, as the first black American to hold the highest national security positions, Powell's legacy remains overshadowed by his public advocacy for the 2003 invasion of Iraq and his infamous presentation before the United Nations Security Council on February 5, 2003, claiming that President Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and presented a gathering and imminent danger. Power later called it a permanent blot on his record. For more on Powell's legacy, I'm joined by Sarah Leah Whitman, former executive director for the MENA region at Human Rights Watch. Uh, Sarah Leah Whitson, it's been said many times that Colin Powell was probably the only U.S. public figure who could have stopped the United States from going ahead with its devastating war and invasion of Iraq, and he failed to do so. Is that an overstatement? Well, it was certainly a clear statement that he did nothing to actually stop the war and instead went on to cheerlead the war with uh, false information, uh, information that he kind of later acknowledged was uh, false and inaccurate and tried to blame others for. Uh, but the evidence is very clear that he knew that the evidence he presented before uh, the United Nations to the entire world to justify America's invasion of Iraq um, was weak and false. And it's uh, really a, a great discredit uh, to uh, uh, the American people, but really most of all to the Iraqi people. You tweeted this week this, Colin Powell never atoned for lying to the American people, to the entire world about Iraq. He falsified evidence to justify the invasion. He may have recognized his mistake, but he never apologized to the Iraqi people for the death and destruction he helped cause. Could it have been a good faith mistake based on faulty intelligence? Or was it a deliberate lie uh, to sell the U.S. invasion to a skeptic global audience? You know, there's never been a complete congressional investigation into the testimony he gave to uh, the United Nations, um, nor has there ever been a review of the actual intelligence that he relied on uh, for that. Um, but there is a record of the notes that he received from his own State Department staff indicating uh, the bits and pieces of the evidence that were weak uh, and saying they were unsubstantiated. Uh, and very clearly, uh, the uh, Mr. Powell, Secretary Powell, disregarded the advice of his own staff and went ahead and exaggerated uh, the information and presented the information that he knew had no sourcing or had weak sourcing. Um, so yes, I think he has a lot more responsibility than he ever even acknowledged uh, in his interview with Barbara Walters and later in interviews with others. He suggested that others had misled him, others had steered him the right way. Um, but the fact is, that he could have, at least he could have resigned, and he didn't do that. If he opposed the war and he thought it was bad, uh, he should at minimum have resigned. And he reportedly told his uh, chief of staff at the time, Lawrence Wilkerson, quite casually after he made a presentation 
to the United Nations Security Council on the 5th of February 2003. Imagine what would happen if the information ends up not being accurate and we end up sending 500,000 troops to Iraq. When I interviewed him in Washington in July of 2003, four months after the war, I asked him how the U.S. administration was going to convince anyone in the world about taking a tough stance against Syria and Iran, as the Bush administration was doing at the time. Given its inability to present any evidence of weapons of mass destruction in the case of Iraq, he mentioned his own role in the lead up to the war, and he said this to me. He said, I think the case I presented on the 5th of February has yet to be undercut by what we have, what we have seen. Now we have people searching all over Iraq, and I'm quite confident that when they finish their work, when they finish their report, there will be no question about it. He still believed, he still hoped that something would turn up, not before it's, the war, but four months after the war. It's, it's quite an embarrassment uh, and, and, and quite tragic, really, um, because not only uh, did he cause so much death and devastation and destruction uh, for the Iraqi people, and mind you, it wasn't just about his cheerleading for the war. He was one of the senior most uh, uh, government officials of the American government uh, to lead that invasion, to lead that illegal invasion and occupation of that country and all of the harms that flew from it, um, but also the incredible harm he caused uh, to United States' standing, to United States' reputation and credibility, not only in providing, you know, banana republic level false information to a global audience, uh, really the beginnings of fake news in a way that we had not quite seen before with the uh, media eating it up and just reprinting it as some uh, a, a biblical uh, a testimony, unquestioned testimony. Um, but then, you know, forevermore damaged America's reputation, not only for the false evidence, but for the disastrous war and invasion in Iraq. Sarah Leah Whitson, good to see you again. Thanks so much for being on the program. One issue Powell was particularly critical of over the last few years was the U.S. military prison at Guantanamo Bay. He criticized the Bush administration's treatment of detainees and called for closing the military detention facility, saying it would be in the best interest of the U.S. to do so. Asked earlier this year if President Biden would shut the prison at Guantanamo by the time his presidency ends, White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki told reporters that certainly is our goal and our intention. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has told the U.S. Supreme Court that it will allow Abu Zubaydah, a Guantanamo detainee who has never been charged, to present limited testimony about his alleged torture by the CIA. Earlier this month, the Supreme Court began hearing arguments in Abu Zubaydah's case to determine if testimony from CIA agents and contractors who oversaw his torture can be subpoenaed. So what can we expect from this widely anticipated Supreme Court ruling? Joining me now is Mark Denbo, an attorney representing Abu Zubaydah, who has been imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay since September 2006. Mark Denbo, your client, Abu Zubaydah, was captured in 2002 in Pakistan. He was sent from one CIA black site to another, where he was allegedly subjected to extensive torture, solitary confinement, held incommunicado before being moved to Guantanamo Bay in 2006. The Supreme Court is now looking into whether or not to allow testimony about the torture program he was subjected to at a CIA black site in Poland. The U.S. government tried to block testimony on the grounds that it constitutes state secrets. But several justices seemed skeptical of the government's argument. Some even used the word torture repeatedly. Just how important is this case, not just for your client, but for other detainees who've been subjected to torture at the hands of the CIA? I think this case is most important for my client and the other detainees by what the court's justices said. You've pointed out correctly that several justices characterized what treatment he received as torture. No American officials at any uh, level of authority have ever used the word torture. They've always wanted to call it enhanced interrogation techniques, EITs. And now we hear from one of your co-counsels that the U.S. administration says it will allow Abu Zubaydah to provide a declaration to Polish prosecutors, but only if he first submits it to the CIA for review and redaction. Is that an offer that you can accept? Well, first of all, we don't have many choices with offers to accept. Um, yes, that seems to me an offer we have to accept. 
because the question will be not whether we accept the offer, but what they will allow him to say. I mean, after all, it's the contents of what he says that matters to him and to the world, and probably the contents that he says that matter a lot to the United States, and they don't want all of them expressed. But why would the U.S. government intervene to stop testimony from two men who oversaw the torture program, who themselves had already admitted to their role in torturing Abu Zubaydah at a black site in Thailand and to torturing other detainees at other black sites in Poland? Well, you know, you're, that's a, the perfect question. The answer really is that what the government cares about is sometimes more technical. For instance, the government has never wanted to admit that Abu Zubaydah was held in Poland because Pol the, when Poland agreed to do it, there were representations by the U.S. that the U.S. would keep it secret. So once it got revealed, the U.S.'s credibility for engaging in secret diplomacy was damaged. So they don't want all of the information coming out. And even if it's publicly known, they don't want United States officials admitting it. But it's, the language used by the justices is quite telling because one Supreme Court justice even said that it is no secret that the U.S. was torturing detainees at these black sites. Uh, another justice said, I don't understand why he, meaning Abu Zubaydah, is still there after 14 years. Why won't the government allow detainees like Abu Zubaydah to provide their own testimony about their treatment? Well, the official position is any word he utters is a is top secret and classified. That's why what he tells me, I can't always repeat, because what he tells me is officially determined to be secret and classified. But in answer to your question, the day before he was about to be tortured, the torture was going to begin. The torturers sent a cable to the CIA headquarters in Virginia saying, the first one said, if he dies, we want assurances he will be cremated immediately. The second cable a little later said, and if he doesn't die, we want assurances that he will be held incommunicado forever. And since that time, the only people he's spoken to were his torturers, his jailers, and his lawyers, and effectively, that's me. So effectively, he is still being held incommunicado. Oh, absolutely. Had any of the allegations made against him been true, wouldn't he have been charged no. by now? Wouldn't he have been prosecuted? Well, if they were true, it would be easy. You would prosecute him. If any of the things they said about him were appropriate, they could prosecute him the way they're prosecuting other people down there. But, of course, in some ways, the most ironic part is none of them were true. So the man who is not accused of anything is being held in, detain in detention in Guantanamo without a trial. And some of the things that they said about him that didn't turn out to be true was that he was a member of al-Qaeda, not just any member of al-Qaeda, but its chief of operation, possibly even the third in command. It was only when a Senate... Uh, report looking into torture came out in 2014 that the CIA conceded uh, that he was not a member of al-Qaeda. In fact, it had conceded that according to the Congress report back in 2006, and yet he's been yes. held captive by the government without charge or trial for close to 20 years. Is there any end in That's sight correct. for him? Yes. I'm an, I'm, I guess I'm 78 years old. I've been representing him for basically since my early 60s. Um, and I nonetheless expect to meet him free and able to walk on the street in the next few years. Uh, the fact of the matter is that he has done nothing wrong. And the only reason they're detaining him is to prevent the embarrassment of having the person for whom the torture program was created by name was not only not a member of Al Qaeda, but that they actually made a series of lies simply to persuade the Justice Department in order to approve the torture techniques. So he was a creation of the CIA in his biography in order to obtain permission to torture him. And today, after all, and and today yeah. he is one of only 39 men for whom Guantanamo Bay military detention facility remains open. Colin Powell was among those who said that uh, U.S. federal courts were more than capable of handling Guantanamo detainees and that keeping the prison open for this ever-shrinking number of, of prisoners doesn't make any sense. Why is it still open, then? 
it's open because they're not keeping them there in order to prosecute them. They're keeping them there because of embarrassments to the United States. I mean, Guantanamo is a worse embarrassment to the United States every day it stays open. And year after year, it gets worse and worse because the more, the longer you've held people, the better off they should be. The worse off the people they should be. And of course, they're not. And, and today, he is one of only 39 men for whom Guantanamo Bay military detention facility remains open. Colin Powell was among those who said that uh, U.S. federal courts were more than capable of handling Guantanamo detainees and that keeping the prison open for this ever-shrinking number of, of prisoners doesn't make any sense. Why is it still open, then? It's open because they're not keeping them there in order to prosecute them. They're keeping them there because of embarrassments to the United States. I mean, Guantanamo is a worse embarrassment to the United States every day it stays open. And year after year, it gets worse and worse because the more, the longer you've held people, the better off they should be. The worse off the people they should be. And of course, they're not. Of course, uh, the, there are all the legal and moral considerations uh, aside from the financial consideration as well, according to a 2019 report, it cost the U.S. government $13 million per detainee per year, right. uh, compared to $78,000 to hold a prisoner at a supermax facility. Uh, right. So you don't see any compelling reason why this facility should remain open. Any signs that the Biden administration is likely or willing to close it down before the end of, uh, of his term in office? I would say from my perspective, there definitely are signs that they are going to be closing it down. But they're the kinds of signs that are sort of in nuanced and interstitial in other communications. But I'm confident that at least most of the people will be released during the Biden administration. Mark Denbo, a lead civilian military commission counsel for several detainees who were tortured by the CIA at black sites before being held at Guantanamo. Thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome. Since its opening in 2002, 780 detainees have passed through the military prison at Guantanamo, which became a global symbol of torture and abuse following September 11, 2001. Today, 39 men remain illegally detained there. 13 of them have been cleared for transfer by the Periodic Review Board, which is comprised of members of all the major U.S. national security agencies, including the CIA. Three were cleared for transfer this month, including one of the last two remaining Afghans, a Yemeni and a Pakistani. Three of the men who've been cleared for release have continued to be held at Guantanamo for over a decade. One has been waiting for six years. Six were cleared for transfer earlier this year. None of them have ever been charged. So how soon will these detainees be transferred home or to a third country? And what happens to those who haven't been cleared for transfer? Joining me now is Moaz Zambeg, a former Guantanamo Bay prisoner, and Director of Outreach for CAGE, a UK-based advocacy organization. Mazam Beg, like Abu Zubaydah, you were seized in Pakistan in 2002. You were held in U.S. custody, first at Bagram in Afghanistan and then at Guantanamo. You and so many others were labeled, quote, enemy combatants. The rules did not apply to you. U.S. authorities initially claimed that you were an Al-Qaeda member. You say you were tortured, humiliated on a daily basis to sign a confession that you were a member of Al-Qaeda when you weren't. They eventually released you without charge in 2005. No one was ever held accountable. Not a single person was brought to justice for the abuses that you and others suffered. How does that make you feel? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're at the 20-year mark since Guantanamo um, was open or we're close to it, and, and of course the war on terrorism. Um, my case almost pales in insignificance in comparison to the numbers of people that have been held there, almost almost 800 prisoners, uh, many of them who were held in torture sites, in secret detention sites, where there was no rule of law, where there was no access to justice, where not only the CIA took part, but also the FBI, the, you know, the squeaky clean law enforcement agents were all taking part. My own British government's agents were taking part from MI5 and MI6. Um, and it was a an, an all, it, it was a place where everybody could take to take part in the interrogations. Chinese intelligence, Libyan intelligence, intelligence countries, intelligence from countries uh, known to practice torture, all took part in the interrogations. Um, whether it was at Guantanamo or some of the other secret detention sites. And what this teaches us and teaches me, and what it makes me feel, is that simply um, 
uh, some countries, some nations, some states are above the rule of law. The law does not apply. And we've seen with the United States of America that the key architects of the war on terrorism were not only the psychiatrists and the psychologists who developed the enhanced interrogation technique programs, but the lawyers said this isn't torture unless it's organ failure or death, then it's not torture. But when it comes to the abuses you suffered at the hands of the CIA and its contractors, by the time you got to Gitmo, you say you'd been begging to go there. What you'd witnessed at Bagram was so destructive, in your own words. You say, to this day, you, you cannot sleep, and that you forced yourself to not think of yourself as a human being, as a father, as a husband, but as a number, the number you were given while you were at Guantanamo Bay. How difficult has it been for you to start thinking of yourself again as a human being, someone who, who does have rights and someone who can still perhaps uh, take certain governments to task? I, I saw recently how uh, the United States uh, military uh, abandoned the Bagram detention facility in the airbase, and then shortly after that, the Taliban took over. This was a place where I was held for almost a year. It was a place where I saw two people beaten to death by American soldiers. It was the place where I was subjected to the sounds of a woman screaming that I was led to believe was my wife in the next cell. It was a place where, where American uh, FBI agents and CIA agents threatened to send me to uh, Egypt or to Syria to be tortured further. Um, and so when I saw that, I, it was almost unbelievable that this place, that I could perhaps one day return to this place as a scene of the crime, which is what I believe it to be. And to, to kind of reconstruct in my own mind what happened here to me and to others, including those murders. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of a watershed moment for me but it's still not over and I can't get over it. I still can't sleep. I still can't um, get out of this number that I was given, prisoner 558. It's attached to me uh, no matter what I try to do. And you did, uh, and and you did have... sue, you did sue the, the British government and you did come to a financial settlement. So did many of the other um, British nationals who were detained at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we did. That's correct. We did. Uh, in 2010, uh, th there was a settlement reached between myself and uh, several former Guantanamo prisoners in the UK and the government. Um, but the the arrangement was that there would be an inquiry uh, by the British government into uh, allegations that they were co complicit in torture and as well uh, a, a legal case uh, uh, that was uh, outside of that uh, run by the police. Just this week, you tweeted uh, after the passing of Colin Powell that in 2003, he justified the invasion of Iraq at the UN with, quote, credible evidence gained from torture. But no WMDs and no link to Al-Qaeda existed. You wrote, when a powerful black man tortures a weak African man to invade Asian lands for oil, it's not equality, it is America. Was he as guilty as everyone else in the US administration for the wars and the injustices that were carried out under their watch for so many years? Unfortunately, it was. I, I know that Colin Powell later said that he regretted that, that but uh, what was the point of the regret? After all, the invasion of Iraq led to, in increments, the, uh, the birth of Islamic State itself as an organization, which was born in the camps of, uh, of Abu Ghraib and Camp Booker, which was run by General Jeffrey Miller, who himself I met uh, when he was running in Guantanamo and the Enhanced Interrogation Technique Program. So they're all connected. There's not one these cogs in the wheel cannot operate by themselves. They are all part of it. And unless they extract themselves from it, uh, they're just as guilty. Mazdam Beg, former Guantanamo Bay prisoner, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. Almost 20 years after it came into existence, Gitmo remains open. Out of 780 so-called enemy combatants, a concept introduced to blur the lines of legality, only about a dozen have ever been charged. Hundreds were eventually released without even an apology, having endured 10, 15 years in solitary confinement, subjected to endless mental and physical torture. Gitmo, like the war in Iraq, is part of Powell's legacy. He failed to speak up publicly when he was still in office and played a critical role in making the case for the invasion of Iraq based on phony, imaginary evidence and claims of, quote, a gathering threat. Powell knew better, and he may have been the only one at the White House who could have derailed the Bush-Cheney-Rumsfeld scheme. Internally, he argued against the invasion, but went to the United Nations Security Council for a dramatic theatrical performance. He failed to convince the Council to authorize a war that was later described as illegal by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. 
Powell himself called his public support of the war a blot on his record, but in doing so, the general may have been very generous with himself. He was at the very least an active enabler of an illegal war and Gitmo. When I interviewed him in July 2003, he was still vehemently defending the indefensible. History will eventually show whether Powell had been played by Vice President Cheney, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, or CIA Director Tenet, or if he simply did not have the political courage to say aloud and publicly when it mattered, this is wrong. And so in short, while the illustrious rise to the highest levels of the US government by a man of color before the election of Barack Obama is remarkable indeed, and while Powell has been hailed in the United States as an American hero, had he spoken out when it did matter, he might have been a true hero, not just for the US, but for the entire world. That's all from me, Rida Fakhri. Send us your thoughts and comments from the entire team. Thanks for watching.